Hi, I'm Raymond Simonson. I'm the CEO of JW3, London's Jewish Community Centre and the UK's only Jewish arts and culture venue of its kind. Sadly, as you know, we've had to temporarily close our doors at the moment. Um, we've got to think about people's health and safety and we're listening to government advice. But just because we've stopped doing what we normally do in the way that we do it, it doesn't mean we have to completely stop what we're doing and what we're best at. And that is to increase the quality, variety and volume of Jewish conversation in London and beyond. So we've got some treats for you. We are going to put on a whole load of our digital archive that we've been building up over the last six years of some amazing events. We're going to make them absolutely free of charge to you. And whilst you sit down with a cup of tea and put your feet up and watch this amazing thing you're about to see now, our team are going to be planning for a whole bunch of events that we're going to put on digitally over the coming months. For now, this one's on us, it's free. But you know, everything that we do costs money. And at the moment, we don't have the same income streams that we've got. So if you can spare a few pennies, a few shekels, if you can click donate online, that'll be really wonderful. We'd be so grateful for it. If you can do that, that's great. But either way, please sit back and enjoy. We'll see you again soon. <laughs> gentlemen we will begin so please take your seats please make sure your mobile phones are off or at the very least silent i'm sure uh, some of you will want to take photos of our speaker this evening please make sure your flash is off at least that would be great thank you um there it is completely uh, sold out tonight and I can see a few empty seats so I suspect there'll be a few latecomers. We'll try and get them in as quietly as we can to take their seats. Um, so please don't touch and wag your finger at them as uh, I get the feeling I like to do. Um, so good evening and welcome to JW3 for this which is now the third annual Spiro Lecture. Uh, for those I haven't met before, my name is Raymond Simonson and I'm proud to be the CEO of this three-year-old institution, which is London's Jewish Community Centre. A particular warm welcome, not just to everybody, but specifically to some special guests, Robin and Nitza, of course, sitting in the front row. Let's have a round of applause before we even start. Um, more of whom in a moment, but I'd also like to welcome, uh, sitting in the front alongside them, Shoshana boyd gelfan who's the director of J-Hub, a member of the Pears Foundation senior staff team, and lovely to see Daniela and daughter. Um, Daniela is Mitzvah Day's interfaith chair and a key member of the wider Pears Foundation team and family. I have to give sincere apologies uh, tonight for Trevor Pears, who's the executive chair of the Pears Foundation, who is currently in Israel in his capacity as the founding chair of the UK task force on issues relating to Arab citizens of Israel. Now, I think it's worth saying at this point that Trevor was undoubtedly ahead of his time, like he often is, when he created this phenomenal broad-based coalition of organizations that are committed both to the welfare of Israel and to equality for all of its inhabitants, as Jews and Arabs alike. And I get a chance to say that whilst I stand here. And even though he only created it, I think about six years ago, these issues were then sadly at the margins of the discourse of British Jewish community. And I find it hard to believe now, as Trevor's foresight and drive and continued support for the task force has ensured that this once marginal issue has become a core part of the mainstream conversation. So I think we can forgive him just this once for missing the annual Spiro tribute lecture, as he has a good excuse and as this entire lecture was his idea in the first place, so we'll let him off. Um, we know he wouldn't normally miss this event and Robin and Nitza, he sends, he asked me to send his will miss and sincere apologies and his love um, and please excuse his absence. Um, so in my role as the CEO of JW3, I actually, I don't get to go to many of the thousands and thousands of events that we put on here. I'm usually in an office or, or, or out in meetings and I actually quite rarely, um, believe it or not, get to stand on the stage um, like this and say something. But um, this isn't an ordinary event tonight and we're honoring a couple that we all know can be described as anything but ordinary. Robin and 
Mr. Spiro through the creation and the success, first of the Spiro Institute for the study of Jewish history and culture, and latterly the Spiro Arc. And I think many people here have been regulars at many of the events that you put on in those institutions. They've been leading innovators, I think we'd all agree, of Jewish historical, cultural, and Hebrew language education. For any dish, and there's, there's never a time I've ever spoken about you and you haven't corrected me or interrupted you. It's, it's, it's like being married. Um, <laughs> result of really. Uh, they've been doing that for close to 40 years. They have really long been true chalutzim. Now correct my pronunciation. Chalutzim, pioneers. They've been pioneers in this field. And look, we all know they've inspired many thousands of students from every corner of the Jewish community and beyond the Jewish community. And I think there are probably many students and former students and current students of theirs in the room tonight. Am I right? Okay. So you know that I'm not exaggerating. Uh, their educational and cultural programs have a justified reputation for being of exceptional quality and exceptional breadth, offering Jewish history, culture, I'm nervous I'm going to miss something right now, the history, culture, music, theatre, innovative teaching of Hebrew and Yiddish, I was going to say it, um, all complemented with cultural and historical tours and heritage trails, and that's just a small amount of what they've been doing. For well over 30 years, they've blazed a trail in the British Jewish community and beyond. They created the fertile ground that I've said before that enabled the establishment of JW3 as London's JCC. Without your pioneering work and success, you know I believe this, the community would not have been ready to embrace the idea of JW3. And for that, I personally thank you. And of course, we owe them something uh, very directly here at JW3, because the LJCC, which is now part of JW3, following the merger about 18 months ago, that grew directly out of the Spire Institute that you founded and ran for 20 years or so. Now, it's clear to all of us who have encountered Robin and Nitza that they are passionate about engaging people with what they call the miracle of Jewish history and survival. And with the richness of our culture and our language, as a means for strengthening Jewish identity. Their contribution to Jewish life is absolutely worth celebrating. But we have an extra celebration tonight, because only a few hours after we finish here and you go home, a few hours later, Robin will be celebrating his 86th birthday, Kanaina Hora. It feels so perfect to me to celebrate Robin this evening at JW3. In gratitude to you, Robin, as a visionary in the area of strengthening Jewish identity through the learning of Jewish history and engagement with Jewish culture that we now take for granted. Through Robin and Nitz's various projects and institutions, his visionary ideas and dedicated work have inspired and still do inspire many, many thousands of people, Jews and non-Jews alike. Being a pioneer and a preserver of heritage, he has also had an impact on the landscape of London's West End, something I only learned recently, by making St Christopher Street a gem of preserved Victorian architecture. Some people have visited it, yeah. so you know what I'm talking about. And of course, Robin, in your own personal bid to ensure Jewish continuity, you have with Nitza created a wonderful family of eight children and 14 grandchildren so far. Um, and each of his children and grandchildren have, without exception, carry a sense of responsibility to improve the world around them in a modest and unassuming way, just like their father and their grandfather. So, Yom Haledet Sameach Robin, Ad Mevesrim, happy birthday. May you continue your tireless inspiration until you are 120. Now we can give him a round of applause. I'm just really talking until everyone comes in and settles so that nobody misses our main speaker. So if you just give me one, one more moment before I introduce our speaker, who like Robin and Nitzer, is an extraordinary person and a pioneer, it would be remiss of me not to publicly thank Trevor, Pears, and the Pears Foundation, represented by Shoshana and Daniela and by Tanya tonight, um, for all of their support. It was their suggestion that we host uh, an annual tribute lecture to the Spiros, and we hope to be able to do this for many, many more years to come. 
Um, Trevor has long been a vocal supporter of the Spiros, very, very publicly. And I come to realise why. It's because Trevor shares a particular quality with you, is that he's also a chalut, a pioneer. And together that's something you've been doing in the community for many years to come. For many years, and we hope for many years to come. And so that brings us on to our guest speaker, one more chalut, one more pioneer who we're going to bring to the stage, and who's flown especially from the States, especially to be with us. And I hope I've now talked long enough for him to get over his jet lag. Um, Mr. Stephen D. Smith, I'm genuinely thrilled and it's a real honour to welcome Stephen to give the third annual Spyro Lecture. As you know, he's the Executive Director of the USC Shoah Foundation Institute for Visual History and Education based in the United States. And we know him as a pioneer when he first came to our attention as the founder of the Holocaust Center, Beth Shalom in Nottingham. And I really urge you, if you haven't yet been up to Nottingham to go and pay it to visit, you absolutely must. Everyone here has been there? Yeah. I urge the people next to you if they haven't been there must go. Stephen went on to co-found the Aegis Trust, was the inaugural chairman of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust. He's been involved in memorial projects around the world, including the Kigali Center in Rwanda and the Cape Town Holocaust Center. There's so many things I could say about Stephen, but he could put it better himself, I'm sure. We're so delighted that he was awarded in recognition for all of his work at MBE. He's committed to making the testimony of survivors of the Holocaust and of other crimes against humanity a compelling voice for education and for action. His leadership at the Shoah Foundation Institute is focused on finding strategies to optimize the effectiveness of the testimonies of survivors for education, for research, and for advocacy purposes. Let me finish by saying I find it sad that to many of us his work seems more relevant right now in this current political climate than ever before. And as he wrote only a week ago in relation to President Trump's travel ban on entry to the States, Stephen wrote in an article, identifying groups by religion is dangerous and divides society, a sentiment that everyone in this room knows only too well. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please give your appreciation for Mr. Stephen Smith. Jewish people in London? I didn't even know that. Yeah. What a pleasure to see. And actually, it's probably the contingent from Liverpool and Nottingham that are swelling the ranks. Uh, thank you. I thought I travelled a long way, but I came from Liverpool, ladies and gentlemen. So it's a real pleasure to be here today. And um, thank you for braving the weather. If this was Los Angeles, the streets would be completely deserted and everybody would be in bed right now, huddling up under the storm, as they call it. Storm tends to be the, the, the palm trees are waving a little and there's, there's a little, little rain in the streets. And then, what do you think of the storm? Um, talking about weather, um, I came from Israel this morning via Moscow. <laughs> That's actually to do with the fact that there's some pilots from El Al who want to fly a couple of years extra, so they're now sitting on their tuchuses doing nothing while they argue about how long they're going to fly uh, for the rest of their careers. Um, so I had to come by Moscow on Aeroflot um, and talk about positive thinking, which we're going to be sharing a bit about today. So landing, I've never been on Aeroflot to Moscow before in the winter, and as the plane comes into land, you get the normal announcement, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Moscow, where the time is 5.45 a.m., the weather is good, the temperature is minus 22 degrees Celsius. <laughs> so we have a lot of reasons for hope in our lives, um, even when things are bleak, and I'm going to be putting that right on the whiteboard in the show foundation when I get back to Los Angeles. Um, Robin and Lisa, uh, hi. hi. Happy birthday. You know, I was so delighted when you invited me to come and be here, not least because I'll be very happy to leave America for anywhere right now, but the honor of being here with you is, is a real delight. Thank you so much. So this evening, um, I'm, I want to share a little about the Shell Foundation um, and what we do and why we do it, um, because we have a story. 
And the story actually is not just going to be on the screen that I'm going to show you right now, but is also in the room here today. And I want to thank all of the Holocaust survivors that are with us. I can see Renee and Ben and Frida and Helen and Anita. Um, thank you for, for being here. And for the rest of you, thank you for all that you do. Because what I'm going to share today is about your lives um, and what we hope to do with the legacy that you've left us. Manda. Hi, Manda. <laughs> And Joan, oh wow, everybody's here. Um, it's so wonderful to see you all. And what I want to share is uh, about our responsibility in the world to take your stories into the future and how our particular organization is doing it. But it's not really about the organization, it's really about our responsibility and what we do with that in the future. So, you know, I literally live in Hollywood. Now, if you stand still long enough in Hollywood, eventually you end up with a little chair that says director or producer or whatever. So, I'm going to be the script writer tonight. As you can see, I came up with a really original title um, until somebody pointed out that it had been taken before. So, I made a small amendment because we have to amend our scripts occasionally, make sure there's no plagiarism in them. But I want to talk about what our past is going to mean in the future. And we're going to do that in three acts. Well, first of all, we're going to go back in time. I uh, just need to come over. Now, you're going to see this evening the use of technology, and you're going to find out how inept I am with it. I want to remind you every time this doesn't work that I am a theologian by training and therefore do not have the credentials for this, but I do want to show you something. Um, okay, I'm still not seeing it. Let's get a cramp. Okay, it's, there it is. Um, I'm going to play this for you. You may or may not understand it, but I would like to play the whole thing. and some of you were there too, I know. The uh, British movie tone reel that you just saw just then um, was something that I came across when um, looking for the first time that survivors spoke about their experiences. What I didn't expect to find was that 90-second piece, which... Um, is the first audiovisual testimony by a survivor of the Holocaust. So I was looking at that piece and realized that this young lady was standing there in front of this microphone, and what you can't see is who she's speaking to. She's speaking to a row of SS who were former captors who were standing right in front. 
I thought about the courage that it took to do that. What it took to stand in front of that microphone, knowing, and she clearly knows that she now becomes the voice of the survivor to the world because she knows that that camera represents the world. And in spite of the fact of the fear that she might have felt that she's going to speak, she had no idea at that point in time what was beginning. The reason I want to start with Hella Goldstein this evening is I'm going to be talking about media and technology in the future. But I want to start with the voice of the survivor because the survivor has always been, from the moment of liberation, they have been the people that have been courageous in telling the story. And it's not about our technology, it's about the courage to tell. So I went into the Show Foundation archive to look for Hella Goldstein. No, Hella Goldstein. I thought, what a shame. But I dug around a little bit and checked Goldstein this and Hella that and whatever. Um, and eventually I found what I thought was somebody who previously had the name Hella Goldstein, who is now Helen Collin, or perhaps. So I called my colleague in Houston and said, hey, you don't have a Helen Collin in your community, do you? She said, well, actually, yeah, but I think she went into hospice yesterday. So she wasn't in Bergen Belsen by any chance. So yes, yeah, she, she was in Bergen Belsen. She called the next day, not Helen, the person from Houston, and said, you know what? Um, she went in for some pain meds. I believe she's been sent home. I was on the plane the next day and uh, sat with Helen Collin with a picture of her talking and asked her what it was like to be there on that day. And what she told me was, I really, really believed, I couldn't believe that we were free. And there were Nazis in front of me, and all I could think was that when I stand in front of that microphone, they're going to shoot me, but I'm going to speak anyway. So um, I interviewed her about that day, um, and she was really lovely, and uh, she died two weeks later. Her birthday is the 15th of April which is the liberation of Bergen-Belsen, as those of you who know on that day. Um, my birthday is also the 15th of April. And so we promised that we were going to have a party this coming 15th of April as birthday buddies, um, which we're now going to do in some other way, which we're yet to figure out. But certainly 15th of April takes on a whole other meaning. Now, on my slide, you're going to see something pop up each time. So what's the point? This is to, not for you to tell you what the point is. This is to remind me of the point I'm supposed to make about the slide. Um, there's nothing new about survivors speaking in new media. So when we get to the hologram later, it's not new. Survivors have been speaking in new media for many, many, many years. I'll talk a little bit about the project and where it began. Actually, Schindler's List was the movie that uh, the other Stephen made. Um, <laughs> And when he was on the set in Krakow, um, it was just after the Cold War, and some of you that have been back to your hometowns will know, once the Cold War ended, it became so much easier, and some of the survivors went back to Krakow while the film was being made, and of course came across the set. Um, and although Stephen always closes his sets, he said, if Holocaust survivors come and ask what's happening here, invite them onto the set so they can see. So he had conversations with a number of them. And one day, one lady said to him, Mr. Spielberg, I don't want to tell you about this single day in my life. I want to tell you my whole story. And that was the moment he realized he was telling the story of one particular person in a movie. But actually, everybody had a story to tell, and a whole life story too. Hence how the Shoah Foundation came about. Um, it's very unusual that a movie will result in a charity that results in an archive that results in an academic institution. I don't know that there are any other movies that have resulted in academic research institutes. Um, but it makes the point that popular culture is culture. It just depends what you do with it. When you've seen it, when you've viewed it, when you've thought about it, um, what do we do with the thing that we've created that has stimulated our interest? 
I just want a few minutes right now just to show you a little bit of an introduction um, to the work of the Share Foundation in brief and the philosophy, if you like, that sits behind um, what we do. When a thought, a memory, crosses your mind, it can be very painful. But to speak these words, it is a remarkable act that their testimony is This year, there are more people sharing what they feel online than in the entire history of Technology is one reason. But we as humans have this desire to connect. We share stories to both feel and to connect. <laughs> So, Act 1, a race against time. What does that mean? Well, it means that ordinary people, like Susan Franzman and Corinne Oppenheimer here, went into people's homes all around the world 
and they volunteered their time to ensure that in a timely way stories of such as those of Eve and Kitty that are represented there were told. Um, the point is it took people all over the world, 5,000 in total, to collect the testimonies of the USC Shoah Foundation. 5,000 people who dedicated their time and their life and their energy and their emotions to work together with the 50,000 people who were going to tell their stories to ensure it was taken. Testimonies were taken in 62 countries. There's 54,000 of them, as you saw earlier, they're taken in 41 languages. And in addition to Holocaust survivor testimonies, which make up about 52,500 of those so far, um, there's also now been added to that testimonies from survivors from Armenia and Rwanda and Guatemala and Nanjing and other crimes against humanity and genocides. Different stories, different places, same humanity, same pain. The point of it is that actually, uh, I'll tell you a little story. I was writing my PhD at the time when the Shoah Foundation got started. And so, of course, with a distance of 5,000 miles and my superiority as a PhD student, I knew way better than the Shoah Foundation as what was the right thing to do. And so I drafted into my thesis the fact that while the ambition was to take 50,000 testimonies, that probably were better to take 5,000 that were really, really well done and have depth and paucity and clarity. So the lesson is here. First of all, don't trust your own judgment and certainly don't trust your PhD students' judgments because I could not have been more wrong. Because the fact is, it's how many people spoke about their experiences that makes this so vital. Let me give you an example. I was looking in the archive for a particular small town and um, I decided what I would do, I would use my own model. This is just recently. I'm just taking 5,000 of the testimonies and looking for that town within a random group of 5,000 testimonies and I found five. Very interesting testimonies about that little small town in Poland. I then expanded the search to all 50,000 testimonies and guess how many I had? Do the math. 50. Now I could actually really research about the synagogue and the cheder the and, and the music group and the sports group before the war. I could really find out connections between the various families and who was deported to where and how because actually there were so many of those testimonies there. We'll come to why that's a problem a little bit later. In the UK, 874 testimonies were taken. You can see about half, a few more ladies than gents there, including 14 liberators and six rescuers. But importantly, um, there are, were 45 interviewers and 49 videographers um, who also gave of their time in the UK to make sure that that was done. And thank you, Bernice, for organizing all that. I just saw that he said that. Thank you so much. And the point of... So the point is, thank you, <laughs> really thank you for all of everything that everybody did in this country to ensure that the testimonies of UK survivors are here in this archive because they're not only heard and seen here but all around the world and it's very important for us to... So going back to why uh, the enormity of this is meaningful, 116,000 hours of testimony. It rolls off the tongue relatively easily. We could sit here together and watch the archive if we wanted to tonight. We could press play and go online and do that. And we could sit together and watch it. Now, the issue is we need 13.7 years without moving from our seats in order to get through it. And what's more, we need to speak the 41 languages to understand it. Um, that's a very powerful uh, statement about testimony itself and the power of your voice because you know unlike the Talmud which you can get through in a lifetime um, no one's ever going to listen and watch this whole archive it's going to take all of us together to understand this legacy and that means we're going to have to work together because we've been we've been decreed this for a reason and that's to struggle with it now and in the future on to act two we always have to have a villain in our plots and the villain is decay. Steven Spielberg made two promises to Holocaust survivors when we made the testimonies. Test Promise number one, that the testimonies will be kept 
in perpetuity. Just, uh, promise number two, that they will be used in education. Now, the problem with promise number one is that it turns out that in perpetuity is a very long time. Yeah. And tape lasts about 20 years. So it doesn't really go together very well. So he said, okay, fine, let's digitize it. So we digitized it in 1999 on MPEG-1s. And guess what? MPEG-1s were out of date by, 19, by 2005. So then we had to digitize it all over again. That's one problem. So technology changes. Second problem is this. You may not know this because we trust so, so deeply on our devices and on our disks that we have at home. The newer the technology, the faster it rots. Film that was made in the 1920s is still kind of fine. It's sitting in fridges and stuff in, in Hollywood, but it still plays. Videos that were made in the 1990s don't, well, not very well. And sure as anything, if you stuck that video onto a DVD five years ago, that DVD is rotting right now. So what do you do when you've got 116,000 hours of material and, and it's, it's rotting faster than you can watch it? It's like the, the old adage of the fourth bridge and painting the fourth bridge. You simply can't check it fast enough before it's actually decaying. And by the way, it also goes to the cloud. There's no such thing as the cloud. The cloud is a bunch of machines that have got a bunch of tapes or disk drives in them, and they also need renewing, and they're also rotting, and it all needs moving. And so if you think everything's safe in the cloud, think again. So we had the problem in that we promised that we would look after these testimonies. Okay, these testimonies, that's 23 of them. We have 235,000. So you can imagine how many it is and how big the job is to take each one of those and digitize it, which we did. Um, the reason this is an important thing to share with you is that we treasure what we've got. But if you treasure it, you really do have to, to look after it and treasure it as if it has the value that you assert to it. So we have lots of machines. I won't tell you about what all of these are. Um, but I want to talk about the fact that preservation is not a technique. It's not a machine. It's not a digital file. Preservation is an ethic on several levels. So, Marla gives the testimony. We bring it into our machines and we put it onto the, onto the, we put it onto the drives. Marla thinks it's safe with us. We have to be certain that 20, 30, 40 years from now that the promise that we made to you, Marla, when you gave that testimony is being upheld on machines that have got technology that's rotting. So what we do, we created a digital preservation system um, and what we do now, we have a bunch of basically robots, for want of a better word, um, that digitize lots of them very quickly, 24 hours a day, um, and we treat the data as if it's a life. So we treasure the data as if it's a life. To, to give you this example, so you have a file, and in that file there are billions of bytes of information. If a single one turns to a zero, or a single zero turns to a one across those billions of bits of information on that testimony, we know it, and we know which one it is and which zero it is, and we flip them back. And we check every single file every three months, and we throw away every single piece of data every three years, data material every three years, and we do that on four continents. What it means is I can say to you that not a single pixel, Marla, of your testimony will be lost ever unless somebody pulls all four plugs out. But literally, and even then it's on, on a material, a substrate that will survive that, not a single pixel will be lost. That is an ethic. And why it's important is once you say we're going to treasure it to that level, it flows through everything you do, which brings us to some other points. By the way, that's what it ends up looking like. And for those who are interested, there's five petabytes of it. Um, but the thing is, we can now say we kept the first promise. The promise that it will be there in perpetuity. So one other thing, we're worried about denial. Now, when you put content out on, into the digital space, um, you can do anything with a digital file, more or less. There's lots of things you can do with it. You can change it, you can manipulate it, you can switch things, you can change voices, you can change images. But if you've always got the original file, 
and you can't get at the original file, or at least if you do, you've got to get all four of them, or if you're all separated by thousands of miles of water, what you can actually say is, if something is changed digitally out in, in cyberspace, you can always go back to the original and say, this is what she said. All right, uh, we took all of that, and we have to figure out what to do with it. Um, this is uh, in the very first time we're cataloging and indexing a testimony. I've got to keep moving here because I'll have to get through it. What ended up happening is we ended up creating 64,000 keywords to describe what is going on in these testimonies. Not only that, but those of you who gave testimony, the survivors that came, gave us photographs. We have the largest collection of photographs of the Holocaust, 714,000 photographs, all from family collections, each one of them annotated by voice by the individual survivor, as I'll show you in a moment. And we have a database of 1.8 million names, because of course, um, her, Frida, when she was talking about her experience, talked also about her family, her immediate family and her extended family. And all of those names are in there too. So what it means is that you can merge that with the Yad Vashem database, the US Holocaust Museum database, and all the other databases, and you can then start to create a real living tree internationally to be able to piece together those communities. The way we do that is by working in lots of institutions, um, 75 sites around the world, most of them um, education um, university sites. Also what happened out of this, and uh, part of my talk this evening is about technology, uh, we created um, 11 patents, pa oh, sorry, you have to, pardon my English, I nearly said patents, patents, um, no, 11 patents, um, which we created, including by the way, uh, the patent that drives uh, YouTube and Vimeo, and a few other video uh, servers that there are on, on the web, uh, because we were the first organization actually to place video on the web and search it using keywords, which we hadn't patent. Um, so you're wondering what the point of this is. Well, two things. First of all, is to show you what the Visual History Archive ends up looking like. You can see here um, on this, uh, if I've got a little pointer, around here, we can see these segments here. These are minutes of the testimony. And you can see in each of these minutes, what we're doing, we're indexing what an inter who's sitting on the front row um, was talking about. We can see also where she was. Look on, on our Google Maps and expand that. We go to a slideshow. We might have a look at that in a little while. Um, the other thing is, the most important point of this particular picture is, um, this shows an eater without a cigarette. <laughs> um, Anita came to Los Angeles earlier this year, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it uh, later, um, but she, she actually flew for 11 hours, um, which is amazing. Thank you for doing that, Anita. Uh, I know that took you a lot um, to get through that. Um, what we do with all of this once we've got it, we have something called the Visual History Archive, which is this thing in the middle here. Um, but what we actually do, we take that and we put it into different places because basically everybody accesses information in different ways. Um, the most important thing is, if we've got this treasure trove that you've all shared with us, those of you who are survivors, and we don't share it, then it's not knowledge that the world can benefit from. I had a very interesting conversation with a colleague of mine who was very worried about the fact that we were going to put our content onto the internet because it is very precious. And her concern was, so what happens if it's abused or misused in some sort of way? So I think her starting point was, well, maybe we should just keep it safe and then allow people that are really going to use it and treasure it as we do to use it. And we're having this conversation and we somehow got on to the library in Alexandria and how it burnt down and all that knowledge is lost. And then suddenly she said, oh, wait a minute. Dissemination is preservation. Because if we all know this stuff, it will survive and it will live on through us. It was a very interesting moment because that kind of opened the lid for us to say, okay, how then do we share that? And who do we share it with safely? Um, last year, 16 million people used the archive. And when I say used the archive, it means they came in and they clicked play. Um, that's different to the fire, I guess. Uh, and then the point here is that survivors wanted us to tell the story and they wanted their story to be told. So the fact that 16 million people are now listening to that, and by the way, um, average YouTube usage, you know, is a minute, a minute and a half. The average usage, usage of YouTube on the Show Foundation is 12 and a half minutes for an average user. And in school is 45 minutes average use time, 
which is quite quite amazing that um, young people are using it to that level. So we don't even quantify that here. But 560 million people saw the content through various broadcast means last year. Now, in the same um, PhD, which I got so badly wrong, I got another thing wrong. Or at least I had a supposition that I needed to prove. And that is, I kept meeting Holocaust survivors that kept telling me that when they were in the camps, they would say that we have to survive in order to tell the world. Now, I don't want to say that I came to think it was an urban myth, but you know, when you've heard it a lot of times, you begin to wonder, well, is there sort of, you know, we take a meme these days, is there a meme here in which this is kind of being passed on and everybody's got the memo and eventually everybody's saying, in the camps we used to say that we wanted to survive until we tell the world, so we tell the world, until I found a really interesting source. It was actually an Austrian doctor who tried to help a Jewish person to get into Hungary, who was denounced, who ended up in the women's barrack in Auschwitz as a medical orderly. And she wrote a book in 1946. I know for a fact that from the liberation of Auschwitz to when she wrote that book, she didn't speak to another soul. And she printed the book, and in the book she says, I don't understand it. These, whole, these, these, these Jewish people are hanging on to the barest minimum of their life, and they're saying as they're dying on, on their deathbed in the barracks to their other neighbor who may or may not survive, if you survive, tell the world. And then as I looked, I was able to corroborate over and over again that this was real that there was a very real need, understanding the need to tell the story. So this is a driver for what we do, because what we're trying to do is fulfill the promise, if you like, that was asked of us. Okay, so why do we do all of this? Well, in all of our societies, we're discovering, unfortunately, increasingly right now, there are negative ideas about groups all sorts of groups and in all sorts of ways. Um, we're not going to specify which groups, but we know that they exist in different countries and different places at different times. When you put that together with interests, those interests could be political, they could be land, they could be water, they could be military power, they could be all sorts of different things, and you combine that with a specified intent, which could be a law, it could be a speech by a leader, it could be all sorts of things that tell you there is some intent here. Right in the middle of there is a little thing, a little space that you don't want to be. Because that is the nexus where violence takes place against the group, and it can take form in many, many ways. And it may not be physical, but it often is, and certainly genocide is the end point of that. What you'll notice is this is not a line that says this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, because we don't know how it happens. What we know is that there are various points, of, uh, points that intersect with each other, that when they do intersect, they create that horrible, horrific, perfect storm in which violence is committed against groups. So all of this to say that behind what goes on with these testimonies in terms of how do we work with them, we then say, okay, we want people to use them to gain insight. And we measure that by the 16 million people. How many people are using them? And how do we know what kind of insight they're getting? Um, we want to ask, see them integrated, not just to look at it, but say, I want to put it in my class. Um, because we know that when they do, they get commitment from themselves doing it, but also from their students, for example. And we want them to contribute from it. That is to say, not I just did it for my class, but I'm going to share it with another teacher, because when they contribute, what they're doing is they're participating. And if you don't participate, it's just theory. We all know that genocide is bad. We all know that racism is bad. But if you don't put that into practice and you don't do something about it, it's simply a theory. And what we're after is courageous. That is, people who know where they stand. Curious that they ask questions of themselves and of others, and critical participants in our society. That stripes through absolutely everything that we do, and there's a reason for that. Because if we don't do that, then we're not going to be affecting change. If we only tell stories for the sake of telling stories because we think they're moving, and then nothing changes, then we probably have achieved, not achieved what we've been asked to do by those who gave those stories to us. And we do that to different audiences, scholars, educators, organizations, and community. 
All sounds very simple and straightforward, but the reason I'm sharing this with you is um, if you are a, an organization that's working in the Ukraine, your needs are different to an organization that's working in Brazil versus one that's working in Beijing. So one of the things we have to try and work out is if you're going to share this with the world, how do you do it so you can get it into pieces that each of those different countries can do and locate? Um, everybody has different needs and interests. Let me give you one example you might not be aware of, um, and this shows you an example of what we do. So this is a testimony that I took in Guatemala two years ago. Uh, there's a beautiful, a really beautiful story behind how we ended up taking testimony in Guatemala, which I don't have time for right now. But suffice to say, um, this little woman of, who's about four foot ten um, is one of the most the strongest, most courageous women I have engaged. And when she stood up at the United Nations, actually here in London, when they did the uh, big conference on sexual violence a few years ago, uh, just a remarkable, remarkable world leader. Um, what we do, we get together with a partner. And that partner is somebody that says, okay, we know what to do in this country because we, we sit in this country and we know what its needs are. And what we do then is we take those testimonies and we put them in our archive and then we create educational content with it. Because if you don't take, create educational content, then it doesn't translate itself to the next generation. And then what we do, we create a research program, either at the University of Southern California, where we're based, or among our 75 um, research partners uh, around the world. Um, and then we create a film. This film here is called Finding Oscar um, and um, is just playing in festivals right now. So what you actually have then for every collection, the Holocaust collection, the Guatemala collection, the Rwanda collection, is a whole suite of content that people can use. And the reason for that is uh, very simply, if the archives don't live in the community, in our communities, then they actually die. In other words, we are the ones that give them life, and they are the ones, they in turn enrich us. So archives are not things that just sit there. I'm not going to take you through all the learning aims associated with this, other than to say that um, with everything that we do, what we're trying to do is take from the testimony that we've got something that can bring, uh, bring inspiration to young people and bring them together. So, um, we've had a change of administration and we've had some really challenging times in North America, well, the United States of America very recently. So the Shoah Foundation has its own 100 days, um, started on the 20th of January, and allows us 100 days to inspire respect. Why? Because um, what we've seen is quite the opposite of that, actually, just lately. Uh, and so we're producing a brand new resource for schools every single day for 100 days on hate, on discrimination, on women's issues, on gender, on respect, on community values, whatever it is, a different one for each week. And it's worth going to have a look at those. I won't jump into them right now. Other than to say that if we don't respond with the content that we've got in the world in which we live today, then all we are doing, in fact, is locking ourselves in the past. And we've been given this as a treasure trove in order to be able to challenge ourselves in the present. Uh, this is a little activity which I won't dive into, but um, this takes place, this is in a, in a museum in Detroit. Our, our activities are so bespoke that we'll actually build lessons for specific museums or specific neighborhoods. So this is for a neighborhood in Detroit, where the kids go to the Henry Ford Museum, as you know, is not the greatest fire at Semite, but they, they also learn when they're there about Rosa Parks, who was a woman of courage, and they learn both those stories, actually. But while they're there, they sit in the seat of Rosa Parks, and we talk about what it means to be resilient and to use your voice. And... Uh, the kids in that neighborhood come from, many of them are immigrants, many of them are Muslim kids, and there's also a lot of African-American kids. And they're coming together, um, all of them with an ax to grind in many different ways, but finding resilience and hope in the survivors of testimonies. And what they find is they're looking at the Show Foundation archive and seeing an African-American liberator of Dachau who is saying to them, I went there and I saw what I saw in Dachau and I came back to my school and I went into college and there was segregation and I wasn't allowed in the class. So then the question was, what do I do? I know what hate does, and now I'm the one on the outside, and I don't know how to deal with it. And he talks about that. Um, so each of these programs is really trying to find that point of um, 
inspiration, but the most important thing is we promised the Holocaust survivors that the testimonies that they gave would be used in education to inspire the next generation, and we're trying our best to keep that promise. You don't do all of that, actually, though, without really thinking about the complex issues. You know, with, uh, with 54,000 testimonies, um, many of which have not even been listened to or, or heard yet in some, in some cases, um, there is a great wealth of scholarship. Let me tell you how that works. Little story. So the United States Holocaust Museum has a wonderful pro had a wonderful program of looking at geography of the Holocaust. And it sort of came to an end because the money came to an end, but the geographers wanted to keep going. So we said, well, why don't you come and look at our archive and see what we can do with that? So they came along, and a tremendous uh, group of academics were very, very skillful. And I think what they thought was going to happen was they were going to come and look at the archive, and they're going to find all the geographic points. And the geographic points they found would help to prove what they already knew about those places. But what happened was when they heard the story, the place itself changed. Because it was no longer a data point. It was, it was a part of somebody's life. So the family that ended up going to the deportation center, and some go to Auschwitz, and some go to um, Ravensbrück, it wasn't clear why, why that family split. Well, actually, it was about a choice. It was about a choice because one of the women was pregnant, but they couldn't see that from the train timetable, that the woman was pregnant and they had to decide what to do and go and hide and then do this and do that. And eventually she ended up in Ravensbrück pregnant. And so the stories change what we know even about the landscape and about the history itself. And that group is now working, um, and you can see here, just 681 courses taught in higher education using the archive um, to date. Okay, Act 3, because we've got to get through this and have some questions. So, what is the future of our past? Well, this is what the Share Foundation is going to look like a year from now. It's all mobile, it's all iPhones, it's all tablets, it's all digital, but it's not because we can do that. It's all about, so who are our users and what do we want them to get out of that? And we won't uh, dive into each one of them this. But one of the key things is that every generation is going to hear these stories in a different way because the world changes. Our way of accessing the world changes. Our, even just our devices change year on year, as, um, as we know. Um, this is what looking at testimony is going to look like um, very shortly also. Um, this is something called iWalks. So what it means is when you take your holiday vacation to Budapest and to Prague or wherever you're going to go, um, what it's going to do is going to populate a little bit like Pokemon Go for Holocaust testimonies. When you're in a place, you're going to be able to find lots and lots and lots of content. And we're busy building these right now and testing them. And I have to say, I've done a bunch of them uh, with my colleagues who live and work in, in Eastern Europe. And to be standing in this industrial site in Prague with these kind of dreary concrete buildings, and then suddenly to find out you're standing on a site of resistance of, of these young men who were working together with their Czech counterpart, right where you're standing, and you're hearing their testimony, you look up and you see the church that they're talking about, and it's right in front of your eyes. It's the most wonderful experience, and this is going to be done all around the world. And this is just a couple who are testing, um, this one here at the United Nations, and this one here at uh, in Budapest. And um, the point is that actually the place makes a story real, but also uh, the story makes places real. Um, so on to virtual reality. Um, let's get this over here. This is uh, Roman Kent. We know Roman Kent, Ben. Um, we're older than you, Robin, so keep going. He's got a couple of years on you. Uh, but first time looking at virtual reality last week um, because he was about to go become a star in virtual reality, so we want to let him know what he's up for. When I look at it, it seems to me I'm impressed. So I'm so that's Roman in his apartment in Manhattan last week. Um, he's about to tell the story of his dog Lala, and it's going to be a beautiful um, virtual reality piece for six to ten year olds um, about the Holocaust and what happened with his dog Lala. And it's going to be a beautiful animation that um, is going to look uh, really beautiful. And uh, most importantly, Roman, who is a pillar of all of our societies, actually, he's vice chairman of the Claims Conference. He's Chairman of the American Survivors Association. He's uh, on the Al International Auschwitz Committee. He's like Ben Shadow. The two of them like, go everywhere together. Um, 
really a pillar of our society. And um, when you ask him what's the most important thing that you do, he said, it's the story of my dog Lala, because Lala teaches us love is stronger than hate. And if every seven-year-old can get that, we might start to make some difference in our world. Um, this is Pinchas Gutter. Uh, as you can see, he's um, in a barracks, actually it's at Maidanic. Um, he's also been uh, giving testimony in virtual reality for the Shell Foundation. But in this case, what's happening is um, we are creating, recreating the room um, by photographing the whole room. And then what you do is we film him in the space, as you can see on a green screen, but then what we do, we place him into that space so that when you're inside the virtual reality space, you can literally walk up to him and he will tell you his story about that space. Why it's really important is, or why it's valuable, we think, is that while he's standing there, he can talk about the fact that this was the door where he separated from his father. And he's standing right by it, and you're in that space with him. Some of us have done those sort of tours where we would go with Holocaust survivors to um, places uh, of remembrance and know the power of that. Obviously, that experience won't be there for much longer. This doesn't replace it. But now you can go to seven barracks, different barracks with Pinchas, um, and go into those different places and learn about his story. Um, it's the same story, but it's just a different medium. Um, also, without a cigarette, I need to ask a wallfish, but this time in 1945. Oh, it's your sister. Sorry. <laughs> they got it wrong. Uh, they got it wrong. It was me. <laughs> We got it wrong. Um, the, the issue is that uh, in 1945, um, we didn't really know how this story would transpire. Uh, this is Anita in 2015 um, in Los Angeles, California. Um, part of a project called New Dimensions in Testimony. And some of you may have heard of uh, the project that came out of that, which is the National Holocaust Center does here, interviewing Holocaust survivors about their experiences. Um, Anita came to California and um, answered about a thousand questions about her life. Um, the issue that's underpinning this is that um, actually the questions are as important as the answers in some respects, because it's our curiosity that drives what we learn. Uh, you also might know Eva Schloss, who lives here in London. Um, Eva also came and spent time in Los Angeles um, and was interviewed. Uh, what you'll see is, um, when they're interviewed, they're interviewed in this, uh, this studio which we have in Los Angeles. Um, and what we've tried to do here, and it's another ethic, um, it looks very technical. Well, it is. Um, but. It's not about the technology. It's about the fact that the reason we interviewed um, Anita and Eva and Pechas and others in this environment is we want to make sure that we're trying to think about what's the future application. Actually, we had a, we had a, a real dilemma about this because creating this studio and working in this studio is a very expensive job, as you can imagine. And there's 120 cameras around the subject. Um, so all of that all that camera data has been collected um, and they're there for five days and there's months of research that goes into it and so forth. But one day we had this discussion because we started to think about well, what happens if we do this simpler? We, we scale it back and we do it simpler. Um, and maybe we don't use 120 cameras, we'll just use two. And, and maybe we won't put it in all this fancy lighting rig. What this lighting rig allows you to do is, you know, right now, if I stand here in this light, you've got me in a particular, um, what we call a light temperature. If I go into the shadow over here, well, I would do it. If you go in the shadow, when I'm looking at you, you've got a different light temperature because the, the lighting on you is different. What we can do with this, when a meter's been filmed, we can change the lighting condition of the film to match the people in the room. So that normally when you see a TV, you see what was lit on the set. What we do with this is we light it for the room. So it then feels like, actually, much more like you're there. Now, we don't know if we're going to use that. We don't know if we're going to use the 120 cameras. But if I ask Anita, Anita, do you fancy coming back to Los Angeles 10 years from now and we've worked this out? Not really. <laughs> so we realized that we only had one chance to interview these people in a, in, a, in a really special way. And so we decided to do it this way. And um, so their story is here for the future. So that's not the end. So one other thing to show you. If you give me one second. I just want to show you the results of the kind of work that we've been doing um, with Anita and Eva and Pinchas and others. 
Um, this is Pinchas. Hi. Hello, how are you? Oh, yes, uh... I'd like to ask you a few questions. Oops. I don't know if I lost him. I'd like to ask you some questions. Of course. Any questions you like. Okay. Uh, where were you born, Pinkus? I was born in Woods in 1972. In Poland. Do you have any brothers and sisters? I had a twin sister. What was your sister's name? What was your sister's name? Uh, my twin sister's name, she had two names. Basically, she had a Hebrew name and she had the name that we called her all the time. So the name that she was known by everybody was called Sabina. But she also had a Hebrew name called Shifra Trana. And Shifra also comes from the Bible, and she was one of the midwives that watched Moses when he was floating along the Nile, and they saved him, and, 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 and they were the ones who you know, didn't observe the edict of Pharaoh to throw all the men-childs into the river. So Shifra, there were two of them, Shifra and Pua, and her name, the first name was Shifra. And Trana, I don't know what it means. Uh, what's the lesson of the Holocaust? The most important lesson of the Holocaust is that the world is a very dangerous place. And we have to be on guard continuously against iniquity because it is part of our being. And we have to fight it on a continuous basis. So we have to try and eradicate all kinds of racialism, all kinds of uh, prejudice. And I think that should be the lesson because by looking at what happened in the Holocaust, we should see how the world can, what the world can become if it continues being like that. So Pinkus has answered uh, over a thousand questions about his life, and you can have those conversations, and um, in a moment, if we have time, I'll ask, ask you to ask a couple of questions. Um, so, in conclusion, why, why, why are we doing what we are doing today? Um, it's to continue a legacy, it's to continue a, a moral imperative, actually, that we were given not only on the day of liberation, like when Hela Goldstein gave her story, but actually before that, when Jews who were living in the ghettos and struggling for life, continuing to maintain their identity, continuing to uphold the values of their, fa their parents and their parents' parents and their parents' parents' parents, and trying to just be human in the midst of all of that inhumanity, what we learned from them was that they were not extraordinary people, but that they were really, really ordinary people, 54,000 of them in this particular archive, who each say that they're just an ordinary person, and indeed, that is the tragedy of it, because each one of them had all of the potential um, that was taken away from them. But it, it comes with a moral imperative for me, collect these stories, because if we say that we're going to collect them and we're going to save them and they're going to be there and they're going to be in our archives and we do not listen and we do not listen deeply to them, then not only do we um, do them an injustice, um, but we condemn them and their families and their forebears and their forebears before them um, to a second death, which is that of forgetting not only them, but what their lives meant and the message that those who survived have given us. I know that's why all of you are here this evening. I know it's why you support the organizations you do. And I've been hearing about so much of the wonderful work that's been happening in the UK, in Holocaust education, 
um, over the last few years. Um, and so in coming back here this evening, and thank you for inviting me back, um, I want to say just what a privilege it was to be a part of your community and for all the, particularly the Holocaust survivors are here and mentors like Robin and Nietzsche, so many of you here that helped me to find uh, my own path. Uh, I want to share, tell you uh, that have left your testimonies that they will be there for future generations and we will continue to teach with them and we will honor your legacy, not only now, um, but in the future because um, we don't look back. Um, we look forward to our future too. Thank you. I think we have a just a couple of moments of questions. They can come to me or they can go to Pinchas. He's like, he's not been doing much all evening, so you can ask him some questions. Anybody got any questions? Oh, now I can see you. Hi. <laughs> so do you, do you want to shout out? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, hello, Bobbing. Um, what uh, um, uh, do you do about sharing your technology with that of the brothers in uh, the Holocaust uh, Center and Museum, the Forever Project, who's come to a very difficult stage in that, uh, simply for lack of funds. Are you working together on this? Because it's very similar aim, and I don't know enough about the technology where it's the same technology. I know you, when I saw the first um, uh, 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 finished product, um, it was, uh, we need, uh, one needed to wear glasses. Uh, this was almost 3D without cluster glasses, which was quite interesting. Thank you. So actually we've been um, communicating, cooperating all the way along, Harry. Just let's have a look at you here while we're talking. Just want to see how much you've changed in the last 22 years. There we go. Uh, what's... Um, I actually see you quite regularly. You don't know that. Um, I see you quite regularly, and by the way, also Frida Weinman, because um, my team don't know that I know you, but both of you are in one of their favorite lessons, and when we have visitors come, they show them that lesson. So I see you all the time, all the time. So thank you. Um, so to the point, um, yeah, we do. We, we have been sharing all the way along, um, and um, each project's got its own different elements to it. Um, and in particular, we, we took a slightly different road, as you can see, in terms of how we film, because we, we had the facilities there. It was going to be really impossible to set those facilities up here. Um, but, you know, we, each, each of us have to keep the fundraising going, and it's a big job, as you know. Uh, but we, are, we work closely together. I think Sarah's here somewhere. Hi, Sarah. Any other questions? Oh, sir. Does the about sorry? Hi. Uh, does the foundation have any sort of political agenda? And if it doesn't, and you don't want it to, how do you prevent that from happening? How do you prevent what? A, a political agenda seeping into the work that you do. Oh wow! Welcome to my life. <laughs> So it's, first of all, in North America, a charity, it's very similar to here, uh, they call it a 501c3, cannot take a political position, we're not there to advocate or to lobby on a particular political point of view. And as it happens, the, the Shoah Foundation is a part of the University of Southern California, which means they have a boss who's a dean, who has a boss who's a provost, who has a boss who's a president. So there's a stack of people that have responsibility for maintaining that within the university. So our role is, is not a political one. Our role is to say, what's the content of the testimony? And most importantly, what are the values that we want to be able to attribute to our society? So actually, it's really easy to talk about what's going on right now in North America without taking a political point of view and talk about values. I struggle with it, I have to say, to start with, because it, it's, it's really complex. 
But I'm not struggling with it anymore. I just go straight back to the stories. I go straight back to the values that they attribute. And if you keep that, that sense of, you know, the unit in which we live um, as, is, as an individual unit. So, you know, when we talk about the power of individual action, um, I, I've come to believe in that really, really strongly. So actually, we all play a role. We really do all play a role. And we're seeing this played out right now. That the actions of individuals, even though they may at some point in time take a political point of view because they have to in order to argue their case within the public sphere, as an individual, it, just, it doesn't come down to that, actually. It comes down to who are you? Who do you want to be and how do you want to, you know, particularly why we call our thing 100 day, uh, our program 100 days to inspire respect. If you truly respect, then you don't need to create conflict in order to be able to contribute. I'm completely at peace with that right now because I know I'm contributing and I make a conscious effort to contribute. Uh, I, at the point at which I wasn't sure wait, how to do it, then... That'll create a conflict in myself. We all have to walk our own path on it. Institutionally, I have to do what's right by the overall institution in which I am a part. But I do that also talking to my peers and to my superiors. And, and you know, we, we figure out what it is we're going to say and how we're going to say it and so forth. So thank you. Michael, Hi, Michael. Hi. Are you funded by the university or by the state or the government or how? So actually, the uh, USC Show Foundation um, is very blessed to be in a large institution like the you know, University of Southern California because they do help us in a lot of different ways. Um, and I would say around about 15 to 20% of my Total budget is coming directly from the university, which is wonderful, actually. Real commitment. Um, the rest of it comes through private philanthropy, almost 100% private philanthropy. So it keeps me busy. Mm. So. You have testimonies from hidden children. Yes, so, so the question was, do we have testimonies from hidden children during the war? So we don't differentiate. In fact, the, the, the parameters were for, for the Second World War period. Um, if you were Jewish and you were living in any territory that was occupied by the Nazi part, but by the Nazis or its proxies at any point from 1933 to 1945, regardless of what happened to you, then you're eligible to participate and provide your personal life history. Um, and that's how we've, we've defined it quite broadly. Now, what it means is that I don't go in and look for hidden children, but I could go in here, for example, and I could go um, into this index search here. I could search on those 63,000 keywords and put in children. And what I'm going to get, if I spell it right, um, what I'm going to get is... Um, lots of references to children, children's homes, children's occupations, ghetto children, no, oh, hidden children, 530 testimonies, ghetto children, 572, um, prison children, refugee children, 805. Start to add those up and you're getting into quite large numbers of children which are actually, um, I think the age is 14 and below. So. Have you, been, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, have you been approached by any perpetrators complicit in any of these crimes, and what's been your attitude to accepting testimony from them? So um, I would probably not use the word testimony, but uh, providing witness statement or um, providing a statement. Um, some of you may know of um, the project which has been done by Luke Holland here in London, um, something which I've been following with Luke for a number of years um, called The Final Account. Um, my belief is that when we, when we look at genocide and violent societies, that we need to look at it 360, because everybody is human in that situation. Everybody's making human choices. Everyone's deciding what they're going to do or not going to do. Are they going to resist? Are they going to participate? Are they going to collaborate? Are they going to turn a blind eye? They're all human decisions. Also, not only the individuals, agencies, 
governments, individuals, organizations. So our method actually is to try and get to three, what we call a 360 um, accounts. Now, interestingly, the Show Foundation did not collect perpetrator testimonies originally, A, because we wanted to put all of our resources into collecting survivor testimony. We felt that was a priority and their voice needed to be heard and captured. Um, we will be bringing testimony, not just, we will be bringing accounts of those who either participated or were witnesses, including, for example, I'm sure many of you know the uh, work of Patrick Dubois in um, Paris, who's been filming eyewitnesses um, and bystanders in the Ukraine. What's going to happen is the USC Show Foundation's archive is going to increasingly become a repository where many, many archives come together. Even if you just look on here right now, if I go into this search, um, what you'll see here already, this is our collection, and these are all the people's. So we're already bringing them in, and that will include at some point in time those who were involved in, in the Nazi party or collaborated. So we need to know why they made the choices they made. It's really important pedagogically also. What you will find is when we bring them in, there'll be restrictions on who can see them. Because I've been viewing them, and you've got to have a fair amount of context and knowledge and be able to discern what is the kind of the, the lies from the truth and the, the maybes from the ifs. And the, you know, because there's a lot of smoke and mirrors around those particular, um, particular forms of um, testimony. But we're going to do that with care and over time. So at the back, there's some right at the back there. Being very patient. Yes, it's you. Well, you're not quite at the back. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, I think this resource is amazing, and I'm a teacher, and I think um, it could just prove fundamentally important in our schools. I wondered if you were doing anything to tackle, particularly in the UK, the ignorance which is pervading our schools that the Holocaust isn't actually on the UK curriculum currently the compulsory curriculum and whether in a way such an amazing resource and so much time and money is it, need, it needs to go somewhere deeper in, ter in terms of making sure we educate it about it at a more fundamental level thank you thank you hi Zdenka I just see you at the back there hi um so you know you're you're um first of all the UK is um so far ahead of everybody else in so many ways. You may not feel like that right now, um, but most of our work is in the Ukraine and Poland and Hungary and Slovakia and so on. So first of all, um, the, 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 some of the structures and some of the support that's there from government and is there through uh, Holocaust Memorial Day and the National Holocaust Center and all the organizations that you have already are, are amazing. So first of all, it's a case of saying, how do we leverage it? I mean, I know you do some wonderful work here at JW3 around Holocaust-related uh, subjects. So we've got a lot of resource in the UK, um, and part of it is about leveraging that. And, um, you know, one of my principles, um, first of all, just at a kind of a grassroots level, is if everyone just kind of got their heads together and really worked together, um, it makes things a lot easier. Um, so I just think, was a, first of all, releasing what's already there would be fabulous. Um, secondly, I would say that, um, you know, teachers, when they're really, really inspired um, and have the tools, uh, can be really, really creative, even if they don't necessarily have the environment they're in. One of the principles behind uh, the eyewitness program I showed you a little earlier um, is that we actually decided that what we're going to do is leave it in the hands of the teachers as much as possible. So rather than rather than going to a going to a specific curriculum and saying it's mandated it's not mandated that's a problem it isn't a problem just create fabulous resources that they can't help but use and be a little sneaky about it uh which i can't show you because i'm not getting the full list here um so for example uh, one of the tricks that we've used is this um technology and education every single one of the activities we produce can be ticked off as a standard for technology and education so to be honest, you could be teaching, I don't know, biology. And provided that you're going to contribute to the school's ultimate technology and education standards and they can be measured, then actually you can use the, use the resource. That's providing a huge amount of uptake because teachers themselves then can 
you know, get the credit for what they need to do, teach the students, um, and bring in uh, and bring it into the school. Um, there is evidence to say that mandated Holocaust education. Um, there is some evidence to say hey, you get more uptake, and then there's other evidence to say that the actual results of the teaching are not, not as good because it's a kind of have to do rather than want to do. So our question is, so how do you inspire teachers to really want to do this and make it so easy and so amazing um, that the students themselves benefit from it? I don't think I answered the question, but I wanted to give a few things around it. So this is the last question. Okay. okay. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. And is Thomas Keneally, who wrote the book that inspired Stephen's book, involved in any way in your work? No, well, he's not, actually. Oh, sorry, the question was, is Thomas Keneally, who wrote the book that inspired Stephen to write the, make the film, involved? No, he's not, actually, and that's a really nice point. Yes. And could you also tell me how, briefly, how you got involved in, in this work? What was the start? So the question is, how did I get involved in this work? Briefly. <laughs> 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 and if, um, I tell you what, um, they're going to have to ask me back for that one. Um, all I'm going to say, all I'm going to say is this, though, because it, it does go to a principle, and I'll use this to wrap up. It goes to a principle. Um, I genuinely thought that the Holocaust, as meaningful and as uh, as awful as it was from the vantage point as I had, the vantage point I had as a non-Jewish person living in the United Kingdom in the 1970s, was something that the Jewish people remembered, uh, commemorated, and that, that it was their thing. That somehow, maybe it was a kind of a sacred space that wasn't mine. It was I don't know quite what. Um, but on a visit to Yad Vashem. Uh, my brother James and I went to the, the museum, and what the first thing that we, we thought about there was, this happened to the Jewish people. But this was not the making of the Jewish people. It came out of what we call West European civilization. So where is everybody else on this issue? How come the victims are left to carry the burden of this, and the perpetrators and the bystanders just were able to walk away? And we decided to take our own responsibility um, in respect of that, and the rest is history, as they say. Thank you. I think, uh, as that reaction shows, that we feel absolutely privileged to have had you here this evening. Uh, so let me, let me just say a few, a few uh, quick words of closing. Uh, of course, thank you to our guest speaker tonight, Stephen. It was an honor to have you here. I want to say thank you to uh, Judy Trotter, who works tirelessly on these events and many others. Uh, Pairs Foundation for coming up with this idea to honour Robin and Nitza, our fantastic uh, honorees this evening. Uh, thank you to Gabor for keeping all of the different bits of tech going at the back who works behind the scenes. Um, and really, genuinely thank you, the audience, because uh, this is its a middle of the week in London when there are a thousand other things you could be choosing to do, and you've chosen to come here to honour two fantastic people and to hear a phenomenal speaker. Um, Stephen mentioned uh, Father Patrick Dubois, uh, and we're really excited. We haven't launched this publicly yet, but we'll just tell you now that um, from the 9th of May for three weeks, they're bringing the Holocaust by Bullets exhibition. It hasn't been to the UK before, and they've decided they, they really need to bring it to the UK, and they've chosen JW. Three. We're working in partnership with them. Uh, we're building a huge structure out in the piazza for three or four weeks, um, and it will be available to, to the entire community. So um, you'll all hear about that if you're following JW3. Um, if you didn't get a chance to stop and have a look at the Elie Wiesel exhibition, which I know will be int of interest to this audience, please have a look uh, in partnership with Limud FSU, the Russian-speaking uh, Jewish community Limud. Uh, we've just, that's just gone up um, on Monday morning. 
and already about 1,500 people have come to see it. So do take a look on your way out. Um, last two things. Um, there is a, a, a book over here, a memory book, that's going to be on a little table over there. Please, it'll be really lovely. Like at any simcha you go to, any wedding or bar mitzvah celebration, the book comes around for you to leave a personal message. We'd love you to leave a message, uh, share a memory or some words of thanks to Robin and Nitza for everything they've done for you, for us, and for the entire community. Um, and there is a small reception uh, in the room next door for those of you that are not rushing off if you'd like to thank them in person. So thank you very much and have a safe trip home. Yeah.